On today's starting nine, we sit down with Atlanta Braves first baseman and modern day Ironman Matt Olson to talk about his transition from the athletics to his hometown team, what makes Atlanta so special, and how he approaches the game day to day. It's a must listen for all our diehard Atlanta Braves fans. Elsewhere, more Correa news. It's exhausting, but we got more news of it. The Dodgers are playing the long game, and Mets fans might want to have me killed by the time the show is over. Whatever. Don't give a shit. Let's have a great show. Action! And welcome back to Starting Nine. Carl here in Chicago. Jake in Texas. And an enthusiastic opening as I'm delighted to bring this baseball show to our audience today. We have a tremendous guest in Matt Olson. Uh, good to see you, bud. Yeah, you too, man. Uh, Olson, dude, he's uh, a guy that got paid a lot of money to hit the ball over the fence. Uh, he's on he's on a really, really good team now. And drastic uh, yeah, a change from, from Oakland uh, to the Braves in their uh, philosophy of how to to build a winning team. So uh, very interesting conversation that we have with them. Also, for Braves fans, um, this is, a, as we say in the interview with Matt, it's an olive branch of peace for me. Braves fans have been... Yeah, they're hot on you, man. But f- listen, I mean, the comment like you made, it's a, it's, a, it's a legit concern. It just is. And they didn't like it. They don't, nobody wants to see um, one of their young players sign an extension, a long-term extension, and then kind of coast, be complacent. Um, so uh, I guess rightfully so, but don't take it out on, on Carl. Take it out on the guys that might just loaf around a little bit after signing a big deal. And no one's saying they are loafing. I'm no, just no saying maybe somebody loafs one time. Somebody has before, so it's a legit concern. Yeah, probably not the guys with the Braves. Because that's not, as we've seen historically, that's not the way that the Braves do things. Uh, no, and so we I think learn a yeah. lot about, yeah, we learn a lot about how the Braves do things. Um, a lot about the young players, the culture. And it's not like Matt came over to the Braves f- from like two years. He was a 10-year, you know, he's been in the big league eight years not before he got traded, experienced guy. It's a great conversation, uh, certainly one I want to do more of. And, and another thing, just tying it together, like, yeah, Braves fans came at me last week. I was joking around with Matt about it. I was like, come on the show so we could just have a good conversation for Braves fans. This is the type of starting nine you get. Shit on me. I respond in kind with a little olive branch of peace. We're going to get the Matt Olson later today. Uh, but first, roundtable, vibe check. Your team got fucking throttled on Monday night. Yeah, destroyed. Look, I'm, I'm Good just... thing you didn't go. Yeah, I, I couldn't get out there. I had a big physical that I had to do on Tuesday morning uh, at 9 o'clock. So, you know, I, I don't I don't play anymore, so we don't do the, the physicals. So I got to... I have a good doctor here. So blood testing, EKG, ultrasound of the thyroid, the carotid, just the whole, the whole gamut, just to make sure... What'd you say, carotid? You just, carotid. You just threw... Carotid artery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're carotid. Your thyroid, they ultrasound everything just to make sure I'm still running in, in tip top. So uh, results results so far are good. We'll see. Hopefully nothing crazy. You trust your doctor. And the reason I ask is I walk into a doctor's office. I'm going to fucking trust any doctor, your doctor. But you, you take care of yourself. You have a higher standard of care. When you walk into a doctor's office, are you are you sizing the doctor up or, or do you take the MD DO qualifications at face value. Well, they're a hell of a lot more qualified than I am to speak on my, my health. I, I, I feel healthy. I think I'm healthy. I eat well, I train a lot. Uh, I'm active, but then again, that's why you go to the doctor to take care of those things that you might not see, uh, and to potentially catch something. If there happens to be something, that's why it's so important to, to go to the doctor regularly um, just to make sure everything, you know, get the oil change if, if needed. And, um, you know, oil check and check the dipstick. Um, no, nah, operating fine. Uh, but my, my parents, I don't think they even, they never go to the doctor. So I finally talked my dad into like, Hey, you need to go get a physical just to, just to make sure you're good, you know? So go to the doctor. Yeah, I tell my old man, go to the doctor. And he's like, why? It's just more homework. And I was like, yeah, dude, that homework is keeping you alive. You that's, know? What it, that's what it's doing. <laughs> you know, and, and a lot of people don't want to know if something, something's going on. But you catch it early, you're fine. 
that you know if something is there but back to the physical is fine back to the game um tcu had a great season i mean i was i was very optimistic based on our performance against michigan uh, we just were uh up against uh, an amazing team really there's not not much more you can say about it they they dominated the line on both sides of the ball um and we just couldn't really get anything going. I thought, okay, after that, after that touchdown we scored, I believe it was it was either ten seven or or a seventeen seven. All right, we can we might be able to hang around and stay in this game. And the next time I looked up, it was you know thirty one to whatever. We were down by thirty or thirty one points. So a rough game for us. Good season for the frogs, nonetheless. And tonight I'm going to the UT TCU basketball game. Um, so that'll be fun. We talked physicals earlier, doctor, trust. If you're Carlos Correa, do, would you just go out and hire your own doctor, or do you go to med school? You can't, if you I'm can't Carlos, do, do I just go to med school now so I can learn all the things that are fucking me out of $100 million? Well, if you learn it, it doesn't mean that it's it's still not going to interfere with your, your contract negotiations. And look, this, this whole situation, um, shocking because I thought Cohen was going to figure out a way to get this done. Uh, I know that they, I think everybody knows that they really wanted Korea. Um, and there's two sides of this. Okay, so the Giants, there were red flags raised for the Giants uh, and undoubtedly uh, for the Mets as well. Uh, but then we see him uh, proceed to sign, you know, what looks like a six-year, $200 million deal with the Minnesota Twins, who uh, he was with last season. And they've already done physicals on Korea. Uh, I'm sure that they're going to do more physicals, but they did they did their whole battery of tests, <clears throat> you know, before he signed his his deal uh, previously. There's a ton of familiarity there with uh, Carlos Correa with the, uh, if you're the Minnesota Twins, so they obviously feel comfortable enough to get this done. So it just and it's been a puzzling situation for me from the get go. You know, is if it's his his ankle, his repaired ankle, I believe if there's uh, longevity concerns with that. Um, I, I don't know. It's just, it's a head scratcher because, you know, there have been guys that have had, you know, bones surgically repaired and go on to, uh, have careers that, that, that are fine, that they stay healthy, they sign long-term deals, but there's something, something sketchy going on with, with this situation. And him going back to Minnesota is crazy to me. And it's not because like, uh, you know, Minnesota sucks, or I'd rather play in San Francisco or New York. It's because you did the one year, you opted out, they paid you a fuck ton for that year. Now you opt out, and you're like, well, greener pastures, longer deal. And it's like the guy who leaves his high school girlfriend because he's going to college, and then Thanksgiving break rolls around, and he's texting his high school girlfriend. He's like, hey, you know. So then it, it's just like, uh, I guess the package is up. When Carlos Correa shows up to spring training or goes to opening day and he has those moments, a young Twins fan or sincere Twins or just the culture around there, it's like, dude, we're so happy you came back. Like, he didn't – he doesn't want to – he doesn't want to be there, guys. Well, like, it's because – I think it's because initially he, the Twins weren't comfortable paying him 300 plus million. But once it got to the point where, okay, like maybe this deal doesn't work out with San Francisco, this deal – didn't work out with the Mets. Um, and I'm just assuming that Scott was actively talking to other teams and absolutely in in the owner's ear of the Twins, talking to him. Like, hey, this this might not materialize. You're familiar with Correa. You know his, his medicals. Um, he was with you all last season. Um, if this doesn't work out, like, we, we need to – let's get something going. And, uh, you know, that's that's obviously – what's going on. Um, it's just, it's hard to figure this all out because two teams that didn't know Correa near as well, didn't have the type of information medically until recently that the twins had, they both, uh, said no to the deal. And ultimately the Minnesota twins, uh, signed into this contract. So it's not a done deal yet. Right. Um, but it looks like it's it's going to happen. I mean, there was nothing drastically different from his medical, I'm assuming, last year to this year. You know? Or or was there? This is why I want him to go to med school. Or I want I need a doctor on the inside for starting nine. Just, just for the perspective of 
I don't think the physical results are black and white to say we found this issue right now. I think the physical results are in a way that says this is going to be a huge problem in five years. This is going to be a huge problem in six years. The way it's structured, the way he runs, the load, uh, the the muscle bearing, stop clicking the pen. Like the way he it's just a joke. <laughs> I mean, keep clicking the pen. It's it feels like, good. I know, I know. I get I'm over here like you get Fuck. I know how it is, dude. I'm keep, sorry we're to not in this to you. We're a thousand miles away from each other and we have to pretend like we're in the same room. So like I you do whatever the fuck you gotta do. My point about Correa is that I think it's an issue that people are gonna look at or the doctors are saying five, six years from now this is a problem. And that's why you have the hard stop at six years on this deal. That's where Colin went back. That's where the You think went it's back. potentially the ankle could deteriorate or the surrounding areas, the knee, uh yes. whatever will something will didn't heal correctly. That? Something didn't heal correctly. And they're going, but there's no problem now. Boris is going, there's no issue now. He's fine. Cray feels great. He's 100%. Cray's going, there's no problem. But you have enough of a medical expertise there to say, nope, I, no, don't don't you dare go over six years with this guy. because Yeah, well, and all the expertise that these doctors have, they see, I'm sure they've seen thousands of these types of operations and a certain number of them in athletes. And you can kind of forecast how uh, how somebody might look physically uh, like you said, over the next four to six years. And when, um, you know, it's, it's weight bearing, uh, it's, it's a very, very important, uh, weight bearing joint, especially for somebody who's playing, you know, middle infield in the major leagues and, and expected to play 140 plus games over the course of the next six plus years, I could see why there may, might be issues there. And there's nothing about Carlos Correa that says we'll use him as a DH too. No way. If you're going to pay the money for that player, it's so that he can be out on the field making a defensive impact as well. So you lose that be in the lineup but don't kind of stress yourself out option because you can still get offensive production. from. Like It just wouldn't make sense to bring him in like that. It's a shitty situation because from my sense, Carlos Correa is walking around going, what the fuck did I do wrong? He got hurt. He rehab. He went out and played. He was one of the best at his position. He's one of the best players in the world. And it's like the Giants want you for this. $350 million? Oh, my God. Don't worry. The Giants backed out. The Mets have been waiting because you're that good. And, and it has to be so frustrating for a player to get into this position and for reasons outside of your control. We're talking about a guy who's picked first overall, who accelerated his, his risen to the challenge at each level. And as much as you can live up to the hype, like – He's done it, and now to go get paid and, and these hurdles he keeps running into. Last year, he probably thought when he hit free agency that it was going to be like a 10-year, $300 million deal. But you're waiting on a new CBA. Or like, you know, there there's bullshit issues that force him to take a short-term high AAV deal in Minnesota. And then you think like, all right, well, now this year you get go get it. Right back to square one, right back in Minnesota. Yeah, well, look, I think it brings a little bit more excitement to uh, to the L Central. You know, we've, we've talked about how it's a division that's um, not as electric, uh, some small, smaller market teams. Um, so it's a big deal in that regard, you know. And if, if you're a Twins fan, it's like, well, fuck. I mean, it seemed all but certain that we were we were losing Crea, and now he's back. So. Uh, you know, good for the L Central, at least. And the Twins flirted with first place last year for a while. They had a hard crash in August into the back end of the season, but there was a while there when people said, you know, the Twins are a unique brand of baseball, and Correa was the right move, and you see guys step up. Fucking Joe uh, – our, our guy Joe and Sonny and uh, Luis – a tough organization there to kind of follow from like an interesting standpoint and try to promote the twins. Hey, everybody go check out the twins. Eh. But to your point, Correa comes back and the AL central instantly becomes more. The twins go from being one of the like probably five bottom five interesting teams without Correa into like the middle of the tier to see like, all right, how good is Carlos and how good is the rest of that organization? I'll say that out loud. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, I like it. And hey, uh, Bertie was telling me the other day that she saw a photo, I guess, that Correa posted where he was in a boot 
And I is I don't know if that's recent or not. She said it was. I haven't seen it. I'm trying to find it. Everything I'm seeing that he's recently posted is not in a boot. Okay. Troll. All right. So so Brittany got got. So I'm gonna I'll, I'll make sure I tell her that. You gotta ask Colin stuff when you see that stuff. Just text Colin. Just say, hey, Colin, we're making a big deal about this right now. Because Colin doesn't miss shit. And if Colin doesn't Nothing. know, the the network of of fucking people underneath Colin that know what's going on from Meek Phil to Kyle and Shawnee and, like, the rest of the guys that are around here, there ain't no – you got trolled. She did. I didn't. Fuck you. Well, you bit a little bit. Not really. I, I didn't – I don't trust her <laughs> when it comes to that kind of shit. Did you see – Correa holding a baby, and it and it's a hot dog in a pretzel in New York. It says, like, I love New York. I saw like, that. It, yeah, I did see that. Do, I know you, like, did stuff with – like, you used to, like, post pictures of you riding around Wrigley with Coop in the back, or you had, like, the bicycle built for two or something. Like, do, what's the threshold for including your children into, like, the, we're glad to be here, Cubs. We're into, glad to be here, oh, Mets. Okay. Um, well, I think there's – I think there's hesitancy for – <clears throat> you know, a lot of a lot of guys in in sports or famous people in other uh, industries to kind of showcase their children on social media. Um, but no, I mean, oh shit, I'm looking at the picture now. Oh fuck, it was it was a troll. It's one of the it's that <laughs> it's that account where it's in big quotes and it's obviously not said from a player. Okay, yeah, I mean, I'm gonna wear her out for this one. <laughs> Whoa. We got Emma, kids less than this show. No, we're going to do that too. You know, that's just part of the routine. <laughs> it's part of the routine. No, but um, yeah, I don't know. I think some people are, uh, are more reserved about showing their, their children online, especially on social media. I didn't, you know, I don't think we really did that much. It's not like we're posting photos of our kids every single day. But no, when you're, when you're playing for a team, yeah, your kid's going to support uh, whoever you're playing with. I mean, his I don't know how old his kids are, but Cooper and Palmer were at the age where they like they could kind of get into the Chicago experience and the Philly experience uh, and loved it. Until you're in that moment and you're lo like looking at your kid. I don't have kids. Not yet. Coming soon, hopefully. But that has to be a uh, – especially having the kids when you're in the minor leagues and you're coming up and it's like, yo, if dad ever makes it, I'm making it. I'm working hard today. I would I would imagine that's a, a big driver to putting in extra work and figuring out your craft. It's like, well, I, get this, I got my kids and stuff. So then when you make it, it would be very hard to separate those two. And I say that from a public position. Like, I don't even like saying my wife's name. I don't even like even saying wife. I don't like – you try to like separate because some people don't give a fuck. Some people just want to like poke and pry. And I, that's why I saw Correa holding the baby in the, in the, I love New York. And this is small. This baby's not even a year old. It's like, why would you do this to this baby? Expose this baby to these Mets fans. But again, I don't have the baby. Uh, seems like a nice family guy though. This I'm sure he is. Yeah. I couldn't tell you. Pro sure Carlos Correa podcast. We're very pro Carlos Correa. I, I wouldn't say there's many people we don't like. <laughs> I, I have a Maybe list. Maybe you uh, got a list. I don't really have a list. Uh, I don't hate anybody. I do want to be clear. I don't hate anybody. I do, the word hate is – I. the only thing I hate is the word hate. How about that? I think I'm on board with that. Yeah, That's it's a strong word. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, the Carlos Correa news, it's important we talk a lot about this because this is the only time I'll ever feel bad for a guy who's making $200 million over the next six years. Uh, I do a little bit of free agency, too, with the Dodgers before we get to Matt Olson. I want to talk about the Dodgers because no one's talking about the Dodgers, and the reason I want to talk about the Dodgers is the Dodgers have made moves, and every single move suggests that Shohei Otani is playing for the Dodgers a year from now. Everything the Dodgers are doing right now is so that a year from now we can talk about Shohei Otani, and it's a perfect example of why I think the Dodgers are the clear, and we're going to do stuff with Matt Olson, but they're the best best run organization long-term, year over year in the National League because they're still going to go out and win 9,500 games next year. They're going to compete their balls off, and they're going to be set up to add the best player in baseball the year after and, and 
go down this path. So we haven't talked at all about the Dodgers the last couple of weeks. That's where I'm at on the Dodgers. Well, I mean, it just seems fitting. I mean, uh, to see Shohei Otani play in a Dodgers uniform, doesn't it just seem like the right fit? It's the right move for for him, the Dodgers, the sport of baseball. Like, let's let's get him to L.A. And not, you know, not Anaheim. Well, I can't even, like, I haven't seen him in a Dodgers uniform. And you just you know he's going to look good. <sighs> the all whites, they don't have outlines on the on the letters. It's just a pure blue and a nice, nice fucking soft red. Yeah, Otani looked great, man. Yeah, it's in the handful of uniforms that, like, as a kid or as you <clears throat> as you kind of get into like pro ball, and you have more experience with these organizations. I mean, the Dodgers are in that group of a uniform that you would love to wear at some point as a player. And I would go a step further and say the Dodgers uniform is probably as close to what it was like in 1930 or whatever, when the Brooklyn Dodgers are taking the field, like no changes, whatever, just says fucking Dodgers on it. And Otani is going to look great in that uniform. And even though the Dodgers are a wagon and it's easy to say, I don't want, I don't want a powerhouse. I want, no, I want Otani in LA. I want Otani on the Dodgers. And if he can't play for the Dodgers, it selfishly, obviously, cut whatever. Yeah, I love for him to play for the Cubs. No, it's like Dodgers or Yankees. A guy like that, Dodgers, Yankees. That's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Either way, either way. But I, I would, I would prefer him in uh, in LA. And I, I don't mean I don't. No one gives a shit about what I think where he should end up, but. I think he'd look better in L.A. I think people are absolutely interested because you've played against all these teams. You know all these cities. You know the cultures. You know, like, I can sit here and tell you, like, well, this is what I think of the Reds. You've played against the Reds a 100 times. Shit like that. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I can also argue that, I mean, if you are the Yankees, just think about what that would do if you were able to put him in the lineup with Judge. Absolute game changer. I mean, he'd hit. You could say the same thing about Judge, but I think Otani's probably got a little bit more pop than Judge, and I know that's saying a lot. But when you see what Otani can do, um, I think it's I think it's fair to say. Um, I think he'd feast pretty well in in the AL East. There should be like some sort of competition in baseball to measure uh, velocity. Exit velocity and arm velocity, like arm strength, exit velocity. And then give me one composite number of like, who's the most thunderous. It's gotta be Otani. But then it's like, I don't know. There's a right fielder that can fucking, there's a right fielder in baseball. Maybe not even major league baseball. Could be minors. Could be like in fucking Cuba. What do you think? They could throw a hundred on the mound. Like one Oh two easy. Yeah. But doesn't have near the, the ability Especially at the big league level that Otani yeah, has. So, yeah. I mean, there's a guy. Yeah, there's a guy out there that could probably throw near 100 miles an hour on the mound like Otani. Um, but I doubt has the pop that he has or the exit velocity. Yeah, he'd be wanted for attempted murder because he's fucking drilling so many people. No, I just – it's it's more of just like that raw – like the fact that Otani is as polished as a hitter, as polished as a pitcher – but then you could say he's still like the most raw, talented guy. When do you think we see another guy? Let's just like even they can even do what he does remotely close to what he does. That's a two way guy. I mean, we truth to, truth be told. Yeah, I think that I think that person exists. I think they were born within the last couple of years, and I think you're going to see it come up from a baseball hotbed. My guess would probably, and I'm not saying this because you're a Texas guy, but like, in my opinion, that kid exists. He lives in Texas or Georgia Alabama, or Mississippi, Florida, Arkansas, yes, California, maybe. Take California out. Do not say that. No, it's they not got, a West Coast kid. I'll, I'll They're say too this. Pretty. <clears throat> I'll say this. Just you know, from from my days uh, of playing when I was younger, um, and seeing seeing the ability, the type of ability in these young kids now, it's just. It's it's night and day. Obviously, um, there were many amazing players in little league and and in high school, and there still are. Or there, but now it's 
it's just like the size and the strength and the the athleticism, the speed, the arm strength of these kids now uh, is just truly incredible. So I I would say that by the time like Cooper is in, uh, if if he ends up being being drafted uh, that's in like 2030 I believe he's a senior I think around that time we could see somebody with the ability to do close to what Otani does maybe not on that level because it's a once in in forever type of guy you know we just it's not so, that's why we're so amazed by by watching him play you know it's we've never seen it um at least in our lifetime but I think there will be in the next, let's say, eight to ten years. I think we'll see something quite that's that's at least similar to to an Otani. I think two way players in college are rare, and and I know you get guys that pitch on Friday, DH Saturday, or play first base and close and stuff. But and the reason is it's fundamental to the sports culture that like, yo, dude, you don't pitch and play like at some level, right? You don't do that. You're fucking, you're a third baseman. Stop pitching. And it all it takes is like one asshole assistant coach to be like, dude, stop switch hitting, fucking hit righty, or stop throwing sidearm. And then all of a sudden, the young players like, well, I can't do that. I'm gonna get in trouble. That can alter. So my point is with with the fact that Otani's been so successful and has has like blazed this trail for himself. You're gonna find players that are 16, 17 years old that are gonna have leverage, whether professionally or with colleges, and they're gonna say, "Listen, I'll come play for you, but I want to know for a fact I'm a two-way guy, or I want to know if you're gonna draft me in the first or second round, and I'm gonna commit to you guys and bypass college. You're gonna let me pitch and play, and not to say it's gonna happen to one player, but if you do that across an entire population of players for years, at some point you're gonna start to see this. Where like, who would have ever thought you'd see another Babe Ruth type player again? The fucking record." Record for home runs before Babe Ruth was 138. Motherfucker retired with 714. Whether he could play today's game or not, my point is like, there's some some big person and event happens, and then we all adjust to it. Shohei Otani is that guy. Well, if Otani was here, let's say he was an, uh, an American-born player, and you know went through high school and uh, obviously two way there and then was drafted and in the minor leagues, I think that's where it becomes most difficult to do both on a consistent basis. Um, let's say throughout your minor league, uh, time, whether it's a year and a half or three or four years, Otani was doing it, uh, at the professional level in Japan for seven or eight seasons. So it's just, it's so much different over here and your, your ability has to be so overwhelmingly good in both to not make a guy more specific either as a position player or as a pitcher. You know, I played against guys like Joe Savory who went to Rice, was incredible on the mound and hit like 350 in college. And it's like, okay, like that's about as good as it gets in in division 1. And then you had Brad Lincoln who went to U of H, first rounder with the Pirates and dropped bombs as a as a first baseman. So, um I mean, those those were two of the best that I saw. You had like um, Brian Bogusevic, and you had Micah Owings. Um, but you just dropped a Bogusevic. Yeah, but then like you know they were. He grew up down the street from me. That's my fucking guy. Yep, yep. So you know I played with him briefly in Chicago. It was 2013, I believe. But like they were they were really good. You know they were a good position player, um, and and pretty. You know I don't know. It's just like. It's so hard to be good at one, let alone trying to do both at the highest level of the sport. That's why it's just so incredible that he is able to do what he does. Yeah, he's you. My reaction to Boga Sevich trying just because that's a local guy. Uh, shout out to LaSalle Meteors, but he was so good that he was the number one at Tulane and was the center fielder. And he was so good that when he got drafted in the first round. The team was like, we just know that you are a big leaguer and we know that you're – we just don't – if you want to pitch, if you want to play outfield or – and then kind of the decision is – my bigger point about all this, my rap on this, is that I think for two-way players, there, it, it should or has to or the pressure point there is like it's not a decision. You just – you don't even have a choice. There isn't a choice about Shohei Otani hitting and pitching. You're a fucking moron if you don't hit him, and you're a fucking moron if you don't pitch him. It's not like Shohei's like, hey, I want to pitch today. He's like, we'll give him a chance. So 
it, you're not going to find players or the way the two game, the two way player doesn't evolve is the two way player is not going to evolve. I should say into this like player choice and I'm good at both. It's going to evolve because you don't have a choice because you're losing and you're, you're putting your team in a worse position, not having the player play. Yeah, you're games. absolutely right. And the ability level, it's going to, it's going to stand out. And like eventually as enough time passes, you realize, okay, like you're not, you're not quite good enough to to do both, so we need to focus our time into one. Like the the issue or the deal with Shohei is that he's better than ninety plus percent of of both. So it's like you you have to pitch and you have to hit. Your ability is just too good not to. Um, and you know, just the the truth about it for other guys is that they're not. You know, they're they're not better than ninety percent of of the arms or the bats so we have to decide you're either going to do this or you're going to do that and most times you know it turns out that <clears throat> and this is just the way with professional sports most guys that are two-way guys aren't good enough to do either for an extended period of time so that's why they don't play that long what a great transition to uh brett phillips sign with the angels for 1.2 million so now the angels have the two most dynamic two-way players in baseball how about that little Brett Good Phillips joke? Snuck that great, one in there. great yeah. laugh. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe they're a, maybe they're a contender now. He throws fucking gas though. Like an outfielder hard. gets on the mound. That's why yeah. it would piss me off when guys like that 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 could throw with that kind of velocity would just lob it in there. Come on, man. I'm not saying you don't have to throw it at a hundred percent, but give me eighty five. Give me 95%. You got in the box. You swung like a man. You fucking swung that bat. I'm trying like to do damage. No. Trying to do damage. Right, that's why I think a, a starting pitcher can get mad at a position player that comes in and pitches and lollygags it when you're like, yeah, dude, you think I want to be fucking hitting against Randy John? You think I want to be fucking taking the box against – God, let's see, when you were – who's a na- who was the nastiest pitcher? You, who was the most when you went back to the dugout? You were like, there are guys throwing that? What the fuck yeah. was that? Um, well, I got to, I got to face – I had a, a batter, a couple at bats off R.A. Dickey. I know that's that's weird to say, but he threw he threw more fastballs than you would expect. Like everyone's sitting on the knuckleball waiting for that shit, and then he fucking blows like. And he didn't throw, he didn't throw like seventy two or seventy five mile hour fastballs. Like he he threw it like eighty six, eighty eight, um, and he would just sneak it fucking by you. And the knuckleball was unhittable. Um, so that that was a, that was a really tough at bat, but I think I think Degrom and uh, Luis Severino were were probably my two most electric stuff that I faced. I mean, Severino I faced him when I was in Philly, and just that that was probably the the heaviest fastball I've seen. And he was that was when he was you know ninety nine to one hundred one one hundred two. Um, that was my toughest at bat, probably Severino. Just there was absolutely zero time to react. I am happy in hindsight now the DH is in effect for both. No, me too. It's, it's like that's just a crazy thing to. Th- I'm like picturing you, and you're all ready to pitch and you're competing, and then it's like, all right, go hit. And you're like, oh yeah, of course I'm gonna hit and do the best, put the helmet on. But like, you can't look in then a dugout with like ten guys on the fucking bench and be like, Ooh, this makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's stupid. That's it's like having the field goal kicker ha- have to line up as a tight end or <laughs> as a slot receiver. Like that's just you know, it's it's something that <laughs> that was beneficial for the game, and most of the guys didn't want to do it anyways. And it's it's tough to watch. So uh, yeah, the right move. Bullshit aside, though, we do have a great hitter about to join the show. Um, delighted that we get to bring Matt Olson to this and have had a fun off season conversation up to this point in the show. A lot of this has been like news. You see this trade sign depth chart, big stuff with Correa, little teaser with the Dodgers. I do have to say, I think the Mets are looking for a third baseman right now. Josh Donaldson trade. Anybody, anybody just kidding. That, that just lost me a thousand followers, but I have to say that out loud. I have to fuck with my Mets fans. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Um, We're going to get to Matt Olson. Let's do that. Um, this is a great interview, great conversation with a guy who I think has a tremendous perspective coming from an organization that's objectively underfunded into an objectively one of the best sports organizations in the world. Uh, in my lifetime, I think the Atlanta Braves have won 22 division championships. And I want to say 20 of like the last 27, 
they're a powerhouse and they uh, uh, do it on their own terms. And so we're going to sit down at their first baseman, Matt Olson, and have a little conversation. So let's, yeah, let's, let's do get that. to and that. Homegrown yeah. guy, too. There couldn't be a better better situation for for him and his family and, and the Braves. I mean, it's just it's almost like it was meant to be. And if you're a Braves fan, obviously, I love you. I respect you. Uh, you can say whatever shit you want to me. It doesn't matter. I'm here for you guys. So much so that we're about to talk to your first baseman. Here's Matt Olson. All right, we're now joined by Braves first baseman, Matt Olson. Matt, welcome to the show. Off the top, I'm curious, do I say congratulations about the Georgia Bulldogs? Are you loyal to Vanderbilt? No, it's a, it's a congrats. Uh, I actually met my wife at UGA, so I am an honorary dog. Uh, self, self-labeled, but yeah, once, once I didn't end up at Vandy, I uh, spent a lot of time at UGA, so I'm a dog. Yo, Jake is a Jake is a TCU Horn Frog, so we just right. like to give you a chance here if you guys want to do this bullshit. Well, look, man, I, I don't have much to say. Uh, I was preparing dinner, and before I could even like get the steaks on the grill, we were down like thirty points. Uh, and our producer Colin is is a Georgia fan, also a tough game for me. But I got I got to admit, man, that's that's one of the best college football teams I've ever seen. Uh, we had a nice season though, uh, but it's sad it had to end that way. Y'all had to do us like that. That was rough. Yeah, it was a little cold there at the end, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was hoping I was hoping for a little better game, but uh, TCU had their run, just like you said, Georgia. That was a pretty good squad this year. Yeah, ran into a juggernaut. Well, yeah. uh, what, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? It was a magical season for us. Unfortunately, we got we got pretty exposed. Uh, shit happens. Happens. Yeah. Well, welcome to the show. I this is like the intro is you as a Georgia fan and. It's unique to me that now you're playing first base for the Braves. I'm going to talk a little bit about, so you get traded over from Oakland. You grew up a Braves fan, I'm assuming? Yep. Yeah, so that's just like, hey, Freddie's gone. Now, Matt, you're here. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was pretty cool. Uh, looking back on it with the, with the lockout last year, and then I went to spring in Arizona with the A's for like a day and a half, got traded right away, had to jump, jump right back on a flight to the East Coast to go to Florida. Uh Obviously, they, they came pretty quick with a, a contract offer, and uh, it happened so fast. I finally had some time to <laughs> settle down and, and realize what actually happened. That was like in a vortex. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was pretty cool joining, you know, the team that just won it all, coming back hometown. My family's here. My wife's family's here. It was uh, kind of a no-brainer for me. So there's there's been talk, and I've seen some of it, like the discussion of you or Frenchy, uh, Frank Cor being the best player from your high school, and his, his his claim was that he had what was it one more home run than you? Yeah, yeah, he he barely notched me on homers, but yeah, it's it's an ongoing debate. Yeah, well, that's uh, it's pretty cool, man. Obviously, it's it's every kid's dream to play for the team that they grew up watching. Uh, you are fortunate enough to be in that situation and to be with the Braves for, you know, in the next seven or eight years. Um, is that is that something that, you know, you you dreamed of as a kid or was it like completely something so um, uh, on such a level that no one really ever thinks might happen? But now you're there. Was that were those things that you thought about as a kid or did, was it just something that? You know, once it transpired, like I can't believe I'm I'm actually playing for the Braves in in the city that I grew up. Yeah, I think it was you know kind of a little bit of both. You know, every kid grows up, and especially when Chipper and Smoltz and Maddox and those guys are the dudes. Uh, you know, I like dreamed of myself in a Braves uniform, but then once you get drafted, uh, it's pretty far fetched. You know, especially being out west and and everything and. Um, then once it finally happened, put the union on the first game is kind of like, Oh shit. You know, this is, this is really a, a, a childhood dream that I'm living out. And, uh, as, as the year went on, got a little more comfortable and, um, I'm excited to, uh, fully have my feet in the water now and, and go for this year. When you get to the A's and you come up through the minor league system, when does it click? And you're like, okay, I'm actually good enough. I want more than the Coliseum or I want like, this is. <laughs> Uh, hey, you know, I love I love the Coliseum actually. Uh, and le- let's talk about that for a second because I I don't mean to like shit on the A's. It's it's a reality that the A's don't offer 
what the Braves do to players. It's a pure objective fact. And so I guess I'm curious. My question more is about like mentally as a player, I would imagine it's like, well, I want to get to the big leagues and establish myself. But at any point, was there a crossover? It's like, now I am established. I can, I can swat 40 Jaxie. I'm, I'm a good player. I kind of want to be in a better situation. Did, did that, did you ever confront that when you were with the A's or was it just take it day at a timer? You know, as far as like being out there, obviously not the best stadium, best setup underneath and everything. It, it almost becomes a thing that you rally behind a little bit. You know, like we're here, we're doing it. It helped that we had a, a young team. Um, but there was a point where you realize, you know, I think we thought that it was, all right, they, they traded these dudes, you know, Cespedes, Donaldson, uh, kind of restarted the cycle. We got up and I think there was a little bit of like, all right, you know, we can be the new cycle and, and get up there and, and hopefully they start signing some dudes and, and you know, we end that cycle. Um, once Simeon, once Simeon kind of was, was let walk, uh, I think it became a little evident that, that they were restarting that cycle again. So, um, you know, while we were all happy to be there playing together, I think we realized that we saw the writing on the wall a little bit. So, um, especially last year, like I said, with the lockout, pretty public that I was going to be tried to trade or try to be traded. And Chapman is like, all right, I start thinking about where it's going to be after that. But um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, I think everybody had the high dreams of, of kind of uh, sticking out and ending the cycle and, and, you know, the ownership kind of switching it. But um, looking back on it now, I, I think the, the grass is pretty green over here in Atlanta. And uh, I, you know, going to the park every day is, is sick here. Was it a little demoralizing? Uh, you know, you you drafted by Oakland in the first round, and you spent ten years there. Were you ever like curious or kind of fighting for maybe a change in philosophy? Like, hey, we got a bunch of good players here, but then once they get to the big leagues and they're developed, we just kind of we just kind of keep getting rid of them. And it's got to be tough, as because you. Y'all had some really good players there, you know, during your tenure as a, as an A. Um, so did that did that kind of wear on the clubhouse a little bit when you saw you know guy after guy getting getting shipped out to uh, to a different team rather than trying to keep those guys united and and build something better? Yeah, it's definitely not easy. I mean, and, and got pretty much the complete opposite in Atlanta right now where. You know they're they're trying to sign as many dudes as possible, but uh, yeah, it, it was tough when, especially when your team's having success. It's not like we were winning sixty, seventy games. Uh, we had back to back years with ninety seven wins, and uh, you know you would hope that young guys winning like that would, like I said, kind of end the cycle. But um, clearly not the case. And and you know I I don't want to sound like I'm bashing these guys because I yeah I, I love. I love the guys in Oakland. Uh, Billy and David were always great to me. I, I think, honestly, it's a, an ownership decision uh, to to hit that reset button. Uh, you know, you, you do feel bad for the guys who, you know, you do the right thing, come up, you play well, and then get shipped off. Feel a little bad for the fans for uh, never being able to, to marry a certain jersey. But um, I think it's just part of it, and it's kind of the, the way the A's are. But – yeah, like I said, it's it's easy to look back on and and, uh, and uh, reflect on it, but I, I couldn't be happier with, with my situation now. For the right amount of context here, like I don't want to just spend this conversation talking about the Oakland A's and how great life is now, but it is relevant because it's so um, – the dichotomy between the way the Braves go about things, and you talked about the extensions and guys getting paid – to me, the Atlanta Braves stand alone in Major League Baseball the way they go about business. The amount of homegrown players that come up, and I don't mean homegrown like we drafted. I mean homegrown like from Georgia in the relationships in the community, from scouting relationships to the, the staff members in the front office. And so to me, I'm, I'm sorry to like belabor the A's to the Braves, but uh, it's just such an impor important dichotomy to me because it is a business and it is an owner's decision. But – it does then put you in a place where you grew up, where your wife's from, your family's from. So like, yeah, it's a tough business, but also this is the tough business that puts you back where you're from, playing for your home team. So let's talk about the Braves. Let's spend some time on where you're at now. 
if that's it. you you brought up the ballpark versus the coliseum initial reaction when you walked into the home clubhouse for the first time and saw the difference <laughs> uh, i almost i mean i knew i had heard around the league that it was that it was sweet and you know that's guys on the visitor side so uh i almost didn't believe it when i walked in at first uh it's it's such a nice setup i mean anything you want they get you know this year i forget who it was in spring training uh Cleveland visiting clubhouse has towel warmers. And one of the guys was talking to Alex in, in spring. He's like, we need to get those towel warmers. And sure enough, the day we showed up, they were installed right outside the shower. I mean, just like the littlest things that had, uh, was not happening previously. Uh, it, it's, and, and Alex does such a good job and uh, ownership will, will give you anything you want here. I mean, if, if they if they think it's going to translate to wins on the field or, uh, you know, just team morale, they're all about it. So it's pretty sick. That's awesome, man. Um, so I got, I got to ask you, so we're, we're getting to the middle part of January, and I, I know that you're starting to get dialed in uh, with all your baseball activity and your, and your training. I'm, I know you've been training for a while, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> what does a normal day look like for you when it comes to how you approach, you know, your fielding work, your, your cage work, your, your on-field hitting, um, and then kind of tying that into your training. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as far as, as like during the season getting ready, uh, I think we all know wash, wash his whole routine now. And that's something to stay on top of every day. Um, this year got a little bit of, away from batting practice. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes you get in the habit of, of trying to hit some homers and creating some some bad habits. So this year, I really kind of played with uh, going back and forth there. But, you know, as as far as keeping the body healthy and, and the training, uh, you know, my goal is to go out there and play 162 every year, as you know, cliche as it sounds. So you got you to gotta be smart. The older I get, uh, the more you kind of got to listen to the body a little bit where, you know, when I was – 21, 22, I, I could lift three or four times a week and, and feel great <laughs> during the season where sometimes, you know, you have a bad, bad road trip or, you know, some tough travel, get in late. Uh, maybe uh, just hit some extra recovery stuff that next day and, and do what you got to do to be there at seven. Now, and as you continue to get a little bit older, I mean, you're 20, 28, correct? Currently, I mean, still, still a young guy. Um, You've played 162 games twice. You played 156, I believe, two seasons ago. Now, is that something that kind of comes from you? Or are you just tell, like when you show up, you're like, I, I'm good. I'm in there. Um, don't, don't, need a, don't need a blow. Don't need a day off. Will you continue that? Or will you listen to your body a little bit more um, and maybe take a day here and there? Um, I like getting out there as much as I can. You know, I, I'm never, a, <laughs> it sounds cool to take a day, but then I, I'm sitting on the bench and I'm like, why the hell am I not out there right now? Uh, I've done it in the past. So, um, luckily I, I play a position where, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not moving around too much. And when you move at my pace, it's pretty easy on the body too. So, uh, yeah, I, I like to be on that card every day. Uh, you normally will kind of get a gripe out of me if, if uh, that's not the case. Uh, Simeon with the A's was, was big on that. I mean, if, if you try to tell that guy to take a day off, he might fight you. And uh, he was kind of the, he was kind of the vet when I was coming up and I think he instilled it in me a little bit. Well, it's not very, it's not conducive to success if you've got a guy that can hit 40 plus homers on the bench. So that makes sense. Yeah. And you know, if, if you're struggling, you know, I could see, you know, Snit gave me a, a day where I didn't start this year because I'd been grinding for about a month. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I, I can't get out of out of this funk without getting out there and getting some ABs. So you never know when your next day is going to be to to get out of it. So that's kind of the the thought I have. So if you get that from Marcus in Oakland, who are you giving that to in Atlanta now? Uh, shoot, I don't know. We got we got guys who want to be out there every day. I haven't really had the uh, go Marcus level where uh, it's full freak out. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think Dansby, Dansby's the same way. He played 162 this year. And um, when I showed up, you could tell what, what Dansby had done as far as kind of implementing that. So I kind of just uh, carried it along with him. But 
Yeah, you know, I think it's big. Your best ability is availability. You get paid to be out there and play and try to help the team win. And like I said, can't do it from the bench. And Dansby, we talked to midseason this year, and we had asked because, you know, the Braves are a little slow. Come out of a World Series. People want to talk to you, some new guys, some new pitchers and stuff. And so – but you guys had clearly turned it on in June. So when we talked to Dansby, it was like, yo, what was there a moment or something? And I'm expecting Dansby to say – you know, we knew we were good, and it just kind of came together. No, he pinpointed an exact thing that had happened in the Brave season. Do you, can you take a guess what it was? Mm. Was it Mike Harris coming up? Or <laughs> yeah, he nailed it. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's amazing. That yeah. was so. It's are you guys, Mike Harris? Uh, he's he's stupid. I I mean, no joke. The best young young guy I've, I've played with, and. Position player wise, because you know we got Strider uh, as well, so those two duke that out. But uh, I mean, it's it's easy. They he comes up best one of the best center fielders I've seen. Um, I tell it a lot. You know, I from the time I got to watch the pitch, ball hit the center, turn my head, he's already in a full sprint at the ball. I mean, he's he's getting the balls that people are diving for, standing up, and then hit for average, run power. Um, good dude just real low-key demeanor uh yeah i'm a big fan of mike and and watching him play is, is fun but is the braves like did you know that about mike harris in spring training or was it like it talked in the clubhouse like we have this guy that could be coming up what type of culture is that with the braves when you have a very good young player so showing up at spring you know i, I basically know nobody uh in the minor leagues with him um and mike's up in big league camp and he's taking some swings and I asked somebody about him, they're like, oh, he's 21, he might have been 20 at the time, 20-year-old kid, uh, he's going to be really good one day, and, you know, I kind of just assumed he was 20, 21, he's probably not, you know, making an impact super soon, he's going to double A, and uh, when he got called up straight from double A, I don't think anybody really saw it coming, I was like, all right, it's going to be good, you know, give him a little experience, get his feet wet, and he came out just dropping bonds, stealing, throwing guys out. I caught a ball with his bare hand in center field. You know, like, it, it was just one of those where you could tell when he stepped on the field that, like, this guy's got a little something different about him. Yeah, and I had conversations with Luke Jackson about Harris and with Kyle Schwarber, seeing him, you know, um, many times this season and saying he, he could be the best defensive center fielder he's seen in a long time. And then Luke Jackson was comparing him – and saying his ability is that of, of Acuna's, uh, or being anywhere close to that is just extremely high praise. Um, so when we, and Carl could agree, I think we're impressed with him for the entirety of the season. Um, and it's just amazing when you see these organizations uh, like the Braves that just continue to roll out these elite prospects and this elite talent, like time and time again, um, it's very rare. So it speaks to, you know, Atlanta's ability to develop their players. Yeah, absolutely. And and for Mike, uh, you know, Vaughn came up to Strider, all these all these young bucks that were up doing a lot. Uh, you know, it didn't seem like they were, you know, young guys scared of the opportunity, which you know you come into a, a decent bit from what I've seen and. Uh, Every one of them was there and expected to be there, which I think is half the battle. Why is Spencer Strider's four-seam fastball so hard to hit? Because everybody throws a four-seamer. A lot of guys throw hard. Uh, he, to me, is so amazing to watch through his dominance, but I personally can't figure out why he's that much better than the other people who – other players that can deliver that type of stuff. I don't know. I haven't faced Strider yet. I don't necessarily want to, honestly. Uh, <laughs> I had I had a guy get on first base one time. I forget who it was, and told me it looks like he's throwing ping pong balls. So uh, when you're getting that kind of review from from the guy getting on first, I I could say that's part of the reason. But I mean, you, you watch him. He's he's a maniac about his work. Um, I mean, the the preparation he goes through is is crazy. Uh, I think part of it was injury he had. He wanted to, I guess he cleaned up some mechanics and he's, he's all over, he's all over mobility. Um, he's a super strong dude. I mean, 
I know he had a little oblique this season, but you know, some stuff's going to pop up, but I mean, I, I, he's, he's crazy about his work from Strider. Cause it's like, you have this wealth of young pitchers like Sorokin didn't even play last year. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, motherfuckers, motherfuckers, an all-star didn't even pitch. So nasty sinker at a broader level though. Like when you come into this organization and is it easy for you to tell the difference between these young players, like these young pitchers who just kind of lumped together? Like, yeah, that's Max and that's Spencer and that's Mike. And these guys are, the, do they come together? Are they kind of individualized? Like what, what is, I guess my broader question here is like, what is the culture for these young starters that are so good? I think, I think it's a, it's a really good group. They definitely work together. Uh, obviously these dudes are going to kind of do their own deal, but, um, I, I think just the perfect combo of Freed, Freed and other guys who's big on his uh, preparation. Charlie Morton has been there forever and, and done it. You know, he's 40 years old and, and pitched at a high level forever. Uh, Kyle Wright, uh, Vandy dude, you know, analytic, knows what he's doing. It kind of just sets up a perfect, you know, a solid core for these pitchers to come in. Uh, you know, I'll loop in Travis Darnold and, uh, kind of taking control of staff with it too. Um, but it, there's, if a dude's towing the rubber that day, he, he knows exactly what he's trying to do and, and they're all on the same page, which, um, you know, it's, it sounds easy, uh, easier said than done, but you know, these, these dudes are on top of it. In the clubhouse, do you guys have, do you guys have an outspoken like vocal leader who kind of polices things or says things at the right moment? Um, and there weren't many that came up for you, for you guys last season. You had a great year, um, ended up winning the division, but is there that one guy like ours was, uh, was always Rizzo, you know, um, any, when, anytime someone needed to say something, it was typically him. Um, uh, do you guys have a guy like that or is it just a combination of different dudes? Yeah, it's kind of a team effort. Uh, like I said, most of these young guys do the right thing, but, uh, you know, uh, one that pops in my head, Vaughn Grissom, uh, He's, he's a good dude, but he can be uh, a little, uh, I guess, aloof would be the word at times. <laughs> you know, he's, he's working hard. He's doing his stuff, but sometimes you got to you gotta lock it in. And uh, I'd put myself in that category of, of throwing a little chirp at him to, to get it. Dansby was doing it. Uh, Will Smith, when he was with us, was doing it. Uh, Darno will throw a good chirp. It's... Yeah, yeah, Will Smith's uh, he's he's outspoken nice, to start vet. with. Yeah, yeah, he's he's outspoken to start with. So sometimes you can't help himself, uh, but we it was always done in a, in a good way, you know. Like Vaughn Vaughn wore a you know a, a backpack with like his his agency on it, like an old kind of raggy looking backpack, and somebody just threw him a little chirp, like, "Hey, you know, you're not in Double A anymore. Let's let's upgrade it a little bit." And, <laughs> uh, I yeah, I, I are assholes up. to each other. No, I know I chirped him pretty hard. I chirped him pretty hard on that one, but I I actually got him uh, the backpack. You know, it, it's like it's kind of you chirp him hard, you make him realize, uh, you know, what you do in the big leagues, and then you kind of hold their hand after. And I want to give Vaughn Grissom credit now as an outsider to say, in my experiences with the game, you have to be so talented to get to the level and then have lapses of, you know, where someone's like, Hey, come on, buddy. Like the amount of pure raw athletic talent, um, which then you can say the sky's the limit for a player like that, you know? And why do I look at the Braves and find so many of these young players and they're all paid? Like, like it's so much different than any other organization in baseball. I don't know. You know, I, I think a big part of it is is the city and new stadium. Obviously, a really good team. Um, you know, it makes makes it easy to walk to the negotiation table at being Alex when you can stack all that stuff up behind you. Um, yeah, it's just an easy place to play. Everybody's good. Everybody uh, kind of wants to be here, and, and uh, I know we got a lot of dudes locked up. So, can I ask why? Why did Austin Riley get a bag? Why? Yeah, I mean, everybody's getting paid, but then when you look, you say, hey, Sean Murphy, that's a reasonable deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You go, hey, Michael Harris, that's a reasonable deal. You say, Ozzie Elvis is a steal. And you can go down the Braves list and be like, ooh, Spencer Strider signed a nice extension. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think for some of those dudes, though, it's, it's a little different because, you know, they're getting – that's not going to be Strider and, and Mike's Ozzy – Ronnie, they're going to have a second deal involved there. You know, they're getting it at, at 21 years old. Um, so they're going to be a free agent again, I, which, you know, it's, that's a little, it's good for both sides because they're giving them a chance young and then they lock them up for a little bit and it's not going to be their whole career, but they get a little, uh, you know, reassurance uh, early on instead of having to do the whole arbitration deal and, and battle on the team. And uh, I would say Riley got the bag because – He's, I think he's one of the most underrated players in baseball, honestly. Um, it's impressive what he does. He's just a big, big, strong uh, Mississippi boy, and he can he can hit the shit out of it. Yeah, he hits the ball over the fence, Carl. 38 homers. Like, that. that's, hey, that's why Olsen got paid. He hits the ball and, over the fence. Well, in the first baseman market, this offseason has proved to be, like, compared to the other positions. We're like, I thought Rizzo should have gotten more. I thought Josh Bell should have gotten more. And how these things come and go, it's it's kind of hard to predict it. That, And then you see the third base market, Austin Riley's extension, Correa's deal, you know, with the Mets was kind of, even though he's a shortstop, they plan to use him as a third baseman. It's interesting to see how these things peak and valley. What what was your re- or what was your extension process like with the Braves? You said it it came quick and easy, but was it as easy as telling your agent like, "Yeah, that's it. I'm done. Thank you. Like I'll sign right now, right this instant." Yeah, I mean, my agent and I had, had conversations in the past uh, as far as you know trying to go to Oakland with them. You know, I it was something that I was always interested in. I. You know, I've never really been the guy who's, who's trying to break the bank, and I I want to, you know, have a little security and go try to win some ball games. And so the stuff that we had talked about in Oakland, it didn't wasn't necessarily two way street there, but we already kind of had an idea of stuff. And you know, like I said, when when I got traded over, it was it was kind of a no brainer. Looking around, you know, World Series champs, brand new team, I'm going to be here. You know, in eight years, I'll probably start having kids. My family's here. It's like stuff like that. You really can't put a a, a dollar sign on. And, uh, you know, I, I thought it would be a, a good kind of thing as, as a nod to, you know, I want to be here in, in Atlanta to, to just go ahead and do it. I mean, I didn't, you know, I could have maybe nickel and dimed and, and started off a bad relationship with, with Alex, try to get, you know, 10 million more bucks. But, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was that was plenty for me, and and uh, wanted to hop on it. Well, and so how quickly after the trade did those talks start to materialize? Was it pretty? Uh, was it pretty quick? It seemed it seemed like it was. So that seemed like, and the Braves' intent was to after the trade, kind of like with the Sean Murphy deal, to to get you in and then lock you up. Yeah, it, it was quick. I don't know if they had it in mind, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess Alex did because it was almost like I got done calling my, my wife and my parents and my brother and saying, holy shit, I'm going to the Braves. And then it was like my agent calling me saying, let's talk long-term deals. So, you know, I, like I said, I was in Arizona and, and I hopped on a flight, a red eye out, out East. And I was, you know, I threw iMessage uh, on there with my agent trying to <laughs> talk some numbers while I'm like half asleep, just packed up my whole place and everything. So, uh, no, it was it was a it was a whirlwind, but you know, just something I'm ecstatic about. And I think it's I think it's easy to say like, well, you come from Oakland, you go to the Braves, but no, you back to back ninety seven win seasons. It's not like you're going from one uncompetitive situation to a very competitive situation. But was there anything different about the Braves season this year? where you were like, holy shit, like the NL East, this goes hard, or the fans, or what kind of stuck out from a, a, a player experience that me as a fan would be like, oh, that's fine. I didn't – I would not have known that. Uh, I mean, the fans in Atlanta, I don't know if you've had a chance to go to a game at that stadium, but uh, it's to show up and you know there's going to be at least 30,000 butts in the seat that night uh, – it's it's pretty cool and to to have it behind you. Uh, you know, growing up here, I knew it was a a great baseball city, but uh, to be there and feel it, lights go out, you know, pitching change, everybody's phone lights go on, do a chop. Like it, it's it's a really cool fan experience. Uh, and then 
the NL East is, is kind of no joke. Even, even the teams, you know, down in there, uh, I thought the AL West was pretty solid. You know, you run into the Astros, Rangers are always good. Seattle is always sneaky. Um, but it, it was kind of a, a different beast here, honestly. Um, you know, I know I'm coming straight in off of, of the Mets, Cohen spending spree, but uh, Mets, Phillies, uh, Marlins weren't up there record-wise, but they got three, four, five solid arms, starters, good bullpen. Um, and, I, you know, the Nats didn't have the best year, but still a bunch of young guys there too, so – uh, I got a little, I got a little wake up call as, as the intro to the NL East. <laughs> yeah, it's a beast of a division and it's only getting better. Uh, it really is. Uh, you see what, obviously what the Mets are doing, the Phillies, uh, kind of a bittersweet ending to their season. Uh, so everyone's getting better and, and you're completely right about the Marlins. They've got some dudes on the mound and they seem to always have had that. They got, they have arms, um, struggle to maybe score some runs, but, um, in my opinion, and I think Carl uh, agrees that the NL East is definitely the best division out there currently. Um, uh, everybody's trying, been trying to keep, keep up with you guys, keep up with the Braves. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's no there's no games off really, you know. And not that not that there necessarily were in, in the AL West, but uh, when you're catching Degrom, Scherzer, Bassett, then you go to Miami and you get Rogers, Alcantara, Lazardo. You know, it's like shit, you look back and you're like, shit, I just faced seven aces this week. Uh, (laughs) Can I get a a 90 mile an hour sinker guy or something? (laughs) Those don't exist anymore. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's true. I throw 86 with sink. Was there a, thank you. Was there a player you, you face, a pitcher you faced and you're getting in the box and go now batting Matt Olson. You go, Holy fuck. I can't believe I'm facing this guy at any point in your career because in your kid, Hey, I saw this guy. Um, yeah, you know, there's a couple that, that you realize. One for me was C.C. Sabathia, actually. Uh, you know, you grow up, you watch him do his thing, and then see him warming up and you get in the box, you're like, this guy's big as shit. You know, like, not only am I facing the guy who was dropping Cy Young's, but he's just a, a big human being. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that was one of my rookie years, and he was uh, on his you know last or second to last year, but uh, – it was it was sneaky, a really cool one. Or then, what about Trout when you when you got up and established, and you've heard these stories like Mike Trout's really good, and you've played all this baseball, and then finally you get out there, and you was it what you thought? Yeah, no, I mean Trout is is stupid. You know, I've, it's if you haven't seen him in person, it's it's kind of something you got to check out. Uh, and he's sneaky big, man. He's like uh, he's, he, he's like six four. Yeah, dude should be a linebacker somewhere, honestly. But uh, Thick when neck. you watch him, watch him hit BP if he takes it out there, or, or just listen to him barrel up a ball, it's it's crazy. I when I first came up, I was playing a little bit of right field, and he hit me a line drive one time that I thought was going to just barely drop over the second baseman, and it dropped down to my feet. You know, he hit, probably hit it about one fifteen. And about knocked me over. It's like you know it, those guys. It sounds like they're hitting a rock off their bat. He's one of them. Yeah, no doubt, man. I got I've got one more for you, and it's I think you're a good guy to ask this question to. With the elimination of the shift, do you th- are you excited about this? Do you think it's going to? Um, how much do you think it's going to impact? Uh, you know, kind of your ability at the plate, and are you going to adjust your approach at all? because of the shift change, are you going to just continue to go about your business as you have? Yeah. You know, I don't know. I, I don't know, honestly, what it's going to be like. Um, I haven't hit without a shift in, in about 10 years, it feels like. So honestly, yeah. a ball getting through the four hole, unless there was a guy on first base, I, I kind of forget what it's like. Um, I don't think I'll change the approach. You know, I, there's a handful of times where I'm, you know, maybe if I get down two strikes, I'm trying to shoot that six hole where there's a big gap or, or slap on down third baseline. For, but for the most part, I'm, I'm up there trying to hit a gap or, or drive something. So um, the stuff pull side on the infield is, is a miss, you know. Yeah. So right. I, I do think it'll it'll be good. Um, the the one hoppers to right field, I, I think, were the biggest. You know, I hit a ball 
one ten on a on a one hop and and, and, you're out. and the guys catching it at first before I leave the box is is uh that's that's a tough one. Um I was talking to somebody the other day, I'll probably hit the most ground outs to third base in my life this season with <laughs> with the shift gone, but we'll we'll see. Hopefully it'll bring the average up. It's a great, great like glimpse into the sense of humor of a baseball player because you're right like it's just odds and luck and of course the second they take it away you're going to start hitting the ball to the left side uh is is there like um i guess maybe like a, a general overall like sense it has the stuff gotten better from when you got in the big leagues because i sit here and say i think the stuff from 2016 2015 to where it is now is drastically different. Do you think it's gotten better over that period or even in, in the last couple of years? Can you, can you sense it? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely better. Um, you know, I, it's less of the, the top end guys I feel like are the same, but when I first came up, you had those four or five starters that, like I said, you know, 90 sinker guys who are, are, you know, they're, they're trying to miss some barrels and, and it feels like you're just not running into those guys anymore. I mean, if, if a new dude comes up from AAA in the bullpen, he's throwing upper 90s, he's spinning the shit out of it. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there. And obviously, as the more the science gets into it, you know, these guys are doing all the driveline and, and spinning it and figuring out that tunnel. I, I think it's just going to get better. How much information? And I know I said this is my last question, but I got to know uh, how much information do you want as a, as a, as a as a hitter? Um, you want everything they have, or do you have like specifics that you know kind of help you um, kind of develop your approach? And you don't like to overcomplicate things, or do you want to just show show it all to me and I'll decide what I need? Yeah, I would rather be given all the information and and me be the filter as opposed to kind of getting in the box and and being surprised. You know, I think a lot of it comes back to I got to find a way to tie this into what I do well. You know, I I don't want to go up and I know DeGrom's got a good riding four seamer at the top. But, you know, I don't want to go chase that because I know that's, you know, not a spot where I thrive. But you got to be aware of, of what they got. So, you know, example, being DeGrom, you know, you want him down in the zone, but swinging on top of it you know, trying to borderline miss the ball on top. And the info as far as that, you, you go and you check out the spin rate and the vertical break. And I've kind of, uh, feel like I've gotten a good grasp on the numbers and where I got to swing on guys' four seamers. Cause I mean, that's, you know, that's that's the new big thing is, is the riding heater. So, you know, I've, I've started to dial in what 17 inches of vert looks like compared to 20, 21 and, and you know, go into the box knowing that so you can kind of pick a spot based off where it is. That's that's crazy to hear that you're you're effectively changing your swing path based on a guy's, you know, vertical or horizontal break. That's uh that's something we didn't really see a handful of years ago. Um and I've always been uh, on the side of like, if there's, if, if there's crucial information, like, like there is now, like I, I wanted it too, but then I would try and filter through what I knew could help me be successful and, and not. Cause man, there's just, it got to a certain point where I just, it's like reading a book before every, every series. Yeah. And you can definitely go too far with it as you, you know, probably know too, or you psych yourself out. It's not necessarily something I wanted to get into, but when a guy with 20 vert stood on the mound and I missed the pitch by four inches under it, uh, I kind of, I kind of started having to dig into it. For sure. Yeah. I, my last thing though, uh, obviously thank you so much for your time and, and I know off season, you could be doing a thousand different things. You decide to spend an afternoon with us. Cannot thank you enough. I'm, I'm, if I could take something away as a baseball fan, like, can you give me a piece of advice as a baseball fan so I can be better understanding of what you guys go through? Or, you know, it's like the team loses a couple. And nah, I'm not a Braves fan. I'm a Cubs fan. But, I mean, just from the general perspective of, like, your experience playing the game, you're trying to win. You want to be the best that you can be. And and I watch my team and players and fans watch their teams. And, yeah, everybody wants the best. But from your perspective, what makes – what do you think would be like, like what makes a good baseball fan uh, from like a relation standpoint or what can I do to be better? Yeah. You know, I think, I think my advice to the average baseball fan would be to just chill out a little bit. You know, uh, 
we play 162 of these things. Uh, it, sure, it's going to look like shit sometimes. Uh, you know, I promise we're not trying to do that, but uh, it's a long season. It's not like football. We're going out playing 17 games. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a long haul, and and there's going to be the ups and downs. But I, I think the best fans honestly understand that. Uh, you know, they you're allowed to give a little time. Uh, everybody. If if you have a perfect season as far as hitting or pitching, you're going to be an all star. You're going to, you know, get paid. You're going to be one of the best players in the league. But uh, I'd say for about ninety eight percent of people, you don't just go out and you're not seeing beach balls every day or or you know dotting dotting the catcher's mitt every every time you rear back and throw it. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd say chill out. A lot of games. Uh, we you know <laughs> we started pretty not well this year 500 and ended with over 100 wins you know it's um if it gets down to to september and there's 40 wins on the on the scoreboard then maybe you can you can uh freak out a little bit i wonder if there's ever a time that that statement could come from a, a player to fans it's a guy like you who's played 162 in multiple seasons so um He's right, Carl. You need to take some of that advice to heart and just chill yeah. the fuck out a little bit. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't directed right at you. Don't <laughs> worry. But I am a representative of like the regular fan, and so that's important. It's also important to recognize. I wanted to have this conversation with you, Matt, because the relationship I have with Braves fans can be improved. Braves fans say, Carl from Barstool, this guy doesn't know his head from his butt cheeks. And it's really just more about, I can't cover all 30 teams in depth. I can have good conversation and kind of facilitate. I have tremendous respect for, for the Braves. Where I run into problems with Braves fans is if I say stuff like, uh, here's an example. Last week I said, uh, man, one of the problems with all these extensions is that the players don't have any incentive. They'll just be sitting around eating cheesecake. And Braves <laughs> fans heard that, took it seriously, and now my DMs and Twitter, is, they're just at me. So I was like, you know what, Olive Branch of peace. I come in peace to Braves fans. Let's talk to Matt this week. I was about to say, that's why I got on here. Yeah. <laughs> so you got some beef with the Braves fans. Uh, no, they yeah, had beef with me because I'm just trying to do my job. Yeah. Well, it happens. You know, not everybody's going to like it. No, we'll get Carl out to Truist for a game this year. Yeah. Uh, may, maybe even uh, an introduction to Braves fans in person in spring training. See if we can pull that off. I want to yeah. go to. I want to go to your high school for practice. You don't have to go with me. Just tell the coach. Just say, "Hey, Carl's coming out. He's going to do a video of practice." And I'll be like, "This is the Frenchy Olson High School practice." He would love it, honestly. All right, set us up. We'll talk soon about that. But right. seriously, thank you so much for coming on and spending time with us. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, man, thanks for your time, buddy. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's fun. Appreciate it. All right, that's Matt Olson. What a what a guy. What a guy. Um like like you mentioned uh I believe in the intro, modern day Iron Man. When you can play 162, um and I just the amount of respect that I have for a guy like that that's that's willing to be in the lineup every single day, uh knowing what position players go through on a daily basis. Like there, the last time you feel hundred percent is, you know, basically when you when you show up to spring training, and sometimes not even then. Sometimes you're dealing with shit uh, from season to season throughout the off season. Just just trying to maintain it and not get any worse. So to to play one sixty two and and to show up for the boys uh, night in night out, you know, speaks volumes to um, his preparation and just the type of guy he is. And bullshit about those athletics teams is great because, like, it's important. People are – like, that's a 97-win team back-to-back -back seasons. It's not like he's coming from, like, some sh – like, of course the A's could have done a better job creating a – like, creating a long-term value here and creating an organization that can do damage, you know, not just sell off players year and year again. But – for him to, like, come up in that, be successful, lead that organization, want to, like, be a part of flipping it for the next generation, that's a real com that's a real competitive place where it's like, I know what's happened before, but we're going to be the ones that make it different. And that's the fucking nature of this game is like, oh, it's your turn now. It's your turn. Uh, really a lot of things in that conversation illuminating. Probably the most important, though, I want to say is, Good for medals and to be back home with the family and all that shit. Like that makes me like the Braves more because he's like it's it is very much a community 
sport, and that's rooted in the history of baseball. It's like, all right, well, the boys from Atlanta, Georgia are going to play the boys from Boston who are going to play the boys from New York. And, like, sure, it's evolved and it's so much bigger than that. But then at its core to have an Atlanta kid be like, yeah, I'm the first baseman. I grew up loving it. Couldn't wait to call my brother. Like, yeah. that's fucking awesome. No, it's it's really cool. And there's another generation of, of young Braves, you know, fans out there that are seeing this. And, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's another homegrown, you know, all-star type player that's out there, not just in Atlanta, but in, in all the cities that have, uh, you know, major league sports, uh, you know, major league baseball team. Um, so it's, just, it's cool for, for all of baseball fans to see a story like this materialize. And it, it gives them an opportunity to kind of, to dream about being a guy just like that. So it's cool. And when I think of big leaguers, I think of that type of attitude. You know, for every great little story like Mark Burley, 36 rounder from Community College World, there's like 20 first rounders. There's like 20 guys walking around being like, "Yeah, I, I'm supposed to be here. I'm a, this is who I am. I'm a big motherfucker. I've studied the shit out of this game." Him talking about it, making adjustments against Jacob Degrom, like that's the level this game gets played at. And the message back to fans, like, calm down. Like, I, it's it's, and and there's a lot going on here from the perspective of like. Um, the different realizations and the different nuggets of information he gives. Like, yeah, as a fan, I, you just see it happen and you're like, oh, this guy's fucking awesome. He hits bombs. But, like, okay, here's exactly what goes into it. The vert rise on the four-seam fastball. Never mind. Just show me the home runs. Yeah. It's great. No, it's it, it's cool to hear him talk about how he utilizes that information because um, it only makes sense to do so. If you got a guy out there who – has a significant amount of break on on a certain pitch or or multiple pitches you can you can kind of develop that uh that swing to where okay if it's dropping this much i know where his release point is i have to like i have to swing here or i have to be in this general vicinity uh to score up the baseball um so that's that's something that the young players need to uh, need to listen to because if, if if it's working for a guy like that you know, I mean, you should you should definitely take a look if if you have access to that information. Most most kids don't, but you know, as as you and as technology gets better and better, it's gonna just funnel its way down to the to the younger age groups, and it might even be something that Cooper has to analyze in the next couple of years. Yeah, where the high school coach is standing there on the projector before the doubleheader, being like, "All right, Coop, remember this guy fucking throws yeah. twenty two hundred RPM." Like, okay, mm -hmm. if it goes that way, it goes that way. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised based on that because just the conversation we had. Again, thank you, Matt Olson, Braves fans, uh, tuning into this. All love. It's all love. Always like, love. We're showing up for the same sport, okay? I don't cheer for your team the way you guys all do. I don't really fucking cheer at all anymore. I just love the sport. I love the game. I'm delighted that we got to have Matt on, that you guys get to talk about shit, to hear about what's going on with Oakland, into the Braves, into the specific players and all that young stuff. They're not going anywhere. It's a great organization. They'll be competing for division titles as long as fucking Collins cheering for the Mets. So um, other stuff, some news, some announcements, some interviews next week. Everybody have a great weekend. Everybody rest. Everybody get your mind right. Today is Thursday. Tomorrow is Friday. We're coming out of a long college football season. We're running the NFL playoffs. There's a window coming here where there ain't shit going on other than college basketball, NBA, and NHL. So everybody yeah. stay strong. We'll still be here. Bit. We're good, though. We'll yeah, still be here grinding away. Yeah, I liked it, man. Good show. Matt was great. Uh, yeah, not necessarily a Braves fan, but you know, appreciate what they're able to do. Uh, on a yearly basis it's just uh it's a well-oiled machine yeah they stand alone like if you, that's a that stands alone you can't say oh you're a braves fan that's just like this the way the braves do it it's unique um and so we should do more of this for for teams that warrant and deserve it fan bases that want to get involved uh again like the reason I this is because my relationship with braves fans could use an olive branch so here it is fellas uh, we'll be back, like I said, next week, next Tuesday. A lot of baseball stuff coming. Can you guys do me a favor? Throw me a fucking review. We'll subscribe. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we would definitely appreciate that. Uh, and review Carl. Definitely, definitely give him a review. I mean, he's, he, he works his ass off. Uh, he does a lot of great things for the show. He's trying to bring you guys as much information 
uh, and just be entertaining, and he does that. I appreciate you, buddy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jake. Uh, I got to go to my voice lessons, guys. It'll get better. I'll be back. <laughs> Until next time, this is Starting Night. Subscribe.